you could လုံးနိုင်တော့သူတို့အတွက်ဆိုတောင်ပေးပါတယ်ကျမှာချင်းပေးတော့မှုပါလက်မြောက်ချင်းပေးတော့မှုပါမိသားစုတကွေးတပြ
And if one part rejoices, we all rejoice. And among the world, there is both suffering and rejoicing, both difficulties and joys that are taking place even within this congregation. This is happening in our community. I want us to remember a few things. Number one, that Christ will build his church. He says, I will build my church. And I know we've talked about this. And I want to remind you of this that he said in Matthew 16, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not overcome it. Now again, we know this, we've talked about it, that Christ is building his church. Church, this is the active work which he is doing in the world. It is his ultimate goal that every tribe and every nation and every tongue and every people group would be able to know him. Not the God who is afar, but the God who came near and his son in the face of the righteous one, Jesus the Christ. And gives us his Holy Spirit and renews us and gives us eternal life in all who believe in him. It is the message of the gospel. And all hell battles against that message. We are indeed in a battle. I want you to be aware of this. This is why overt and sometimes covert opposition and persecution come. But we will overcome by the what? The word of our testimony and the blood of the Lamb. The glorious Son. Belief in Him by those who over no. this is what god is doing however i do not want us to be ignorant that there is an adversary first peter chapter 5 says this your adversary the one who opposes ultimately god the devil he is alive and active as well on this earth and he prowls around, just like a roaring lion would. And what is he doing? He's seeking someone or someone to devour. We are told to resist him, to stand firm. And you'll see that time and time and time and time in Scripture that we have a right and a responsibility and an order by the chief commanding officer to stand our ground. Knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brothers and sisters throughout the world. So the devil himself, because of his hatred towards God and God's love for us, God hates, excuse me, the devil hates us because God loves us, seeks to devour us us because we are precious to him we are asked to resist and we resist when we stand firm in the faith and we have opportunity to stand first uh, stand firm in the faith with our brothers and sisters in Myanmar and in North Korea and in Colombia and in Haiti
and all over places in the world. We are of the same faith as them. And Christ asked us, and I ask you, stand firm on the word of God. Stand firm in the life of Jesus. Stand firm in the power of the Holy Spirit. And resist being toppled over by doctrines. Resist by being um, separated by sometimes sheer laziness. Resist by being lulled to sleep by the lullaby of the world that just wants us to be entertained and comfortable and deceived. Christ will build his church, and we have an enemy, and we are called to stand firm because Christ has equipped us. He says to us, next point, I have equipped you. I want you to personalize that this morning. Not a you general, and it's true, it is generally true, but it's also personally true. Put you and you and you and you and you and you and me. The passage we're going to turn to is Ephesians chapter 6. And this passage I recognize as a sermon series within itself, but I just want to highlight just a few items out of this passage. If you have your Bible, go ahead. Ephesians 6, starting with verse 12. This is the end of the book that we have been looking in, we have been camped in. Ephesians chapter 4, and this is at the end where Paul is saying, now that I've talked about this church, now that I've set the parameters of what God is doing by displaying his glory and his wisdom and his grace, now I want you finally, in verse 12, be strong, not in your own strength. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty Power. He is mighty to save. His spirit is mighty. His word is mighty. His promises are yes and amen. Stand for, firm in the Lord and his mighty power. And he tells us to put on a few things. This is equipment. This is something, items in which we live within because of. We are in battle. He doesn't give these things for a nature stroll along the banks of a river. This is equipment as a soldier because there is a battle. Now the enemy, by the way, wants to lull us asleep and say that he doesn't exist. That's a really good plan. And by the way, the devil has been bad for a really long time, and he's really good at being really bad. Covert. Destructive. Deceptive. On the prowl. So put on the full armor of God provided to you. Why? So that you can take your st- Stand against who? The devil? Yeah, his schemes. The devil does have a plan. He does have a scheme. He does have a will. And he's trying to push it into the planet. Verse 12, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood. But it's against who? The rulers. Against the authorities. Against the powers of this dark world. And against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly Realm. I want you to recognize who the real 
enemy is. The devil is the master of puppets. Capturing and using people for his purposes. Often we get that confused. We think the enemy is and we name a person or a politician or a government. And can the, you, can the devil use all of these individuals? Absolutely. But they're not the real enemy. This is why our weapon primarily is prayer and the word of God. Proclaimed and lived in the hearts of his righteous ones. This is where the battle rages and don't be confused as to who the really the real enemy is. This is why we pray for all people, including presidents, including governments. I loved in that film clip, and that's from the movie Sabrina, which was just in theaters, which I got to see, which was great. I recommend it to you. Talking about this is an opportunity to shine the light of the gospel. Those people are not the enemy. They have just been captive and deceived by the real enemy. Are you hearing me? No, I'm not recommending seeing a devil behind every doorknob. But I am saying that you have to be aware that there's a battle raging. Don't be blind. Don't fall asleep. Walk in these things that have been provided for us. When I was first a young Christian, I read a book by Frank Peretti. You guys remember Frank Peretti? Piercing the darkness. This present Never forget those books. I encourage you to read them. I think they're great, actually. It focuses in on the things that we don't necessarily see with our eye, but they are more real than the pews you're sitting on. These things are occurring. God, help us to understand and participate in the real struggle. Verse 13, so therefore put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, not if, we put these things on so that you may be able to stand your ground. Do you see that again? And after you have done everything, to stand. Verse 14, stand firm then. Stand in what you know. Stand in what is true. Stand as the winds and the waves and the powers come against what God has set up. Stand. What will help you? Walking in truth. The truth of the gospel. The truth about God. The truth about heavenly and physical realities. Walk in that. Wear the righteousness covering your vital organs that Christ provides in us in the blood of his Son. Be ready to move in the gospel of peace. This gives us traction and moves us forward and enables us to stand. Peace with God and peace with their enemies provided by the great peace maker, Jesus the Christ. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith. 
in which the enemy's arrows had come in, and they will continue to shoot. Stand by faith. Helmet that guards our mind. Assurance of salvation based upon what Christ has done and placing our faith in him guards our mind. And take the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Now, of all those things, there's only one offensive weapon. It's a sword. All the other ones are defensive. Belt the truth, bless praise and righteousness, shoes fitted with the peace of the gospel, helmet of salvation, shield of faith, all defensive. Offensive to stand your ground, but there's one that's offensive. And it's not a metal sword, it's a spiritual sword. You know what it is? It's the Word of God. That's why it's important to know your Word so you're good with it. You can defend yourself, but also make a mark. This sword hangs in my office. To remind me the importance of the word and what it actually is. We see this image of Christ when he comes back in his glorious revelation. The sword that comes out of his mouth, which is the word. That book that you have more powerful, more dangerous than you think it is. Use it, know it, like a sword fighter who's practiced so often that it becomes an extension of himself or herself. Why we remember and renew and we seek Speak, we stand in and stand on the word and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. This is something that we are going to continue to push into as a congregation. I prayed, fasted, yes. God, what are your goals for this next year? And this is on the list. And it's a short list. Pray. Why? Because it's powerful and effective. Now, with this in mind, be alert. Always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. That's why we're giving you these lists opening your eyes to what's going beyond your personal, my personal, myopic little world to expand to see what God is doing in all the world. Help us. And that's one of my prayers for us. God, open our eyes. Motivate us to be involved in what you're doing. And then Paul says, this is the apostle, pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given me. We pray this for all of our missionaries, our ministers, our ambassadors, those bearing witness, which would include you, so that we would fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel. And he was an ambassador in change. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should, and this is a good prayer for those in particular in Myanmar right now and other places. Pray for their safety, yes. Pray for freedom, yes. But most importantly, pray that they would proclaim the gospel. 
Because at some point, whether we die when we're 12 or we die when we're 112, we will die. The main thing is that the gospel is proclaimed that brings life eternal. So pray that it may be declared fearlessly as it should be. Quickly go to Matthew chapter 28 and apply to this. <clears throat> A couple of things that Jesus said. This is the end of the gospel of Matthew telling the story of Jesus, what he did as one of the evangelists puts forward. And this is the last thing that is recorded in that gospel called the Great Commission. Most of us, if not all of us in here, are familiar with this, but we have to remind ourselves. Number one, I have all authority. This is what Christ has. Then Jesus came to them, his disciples, and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. That's the first part of the Great Commission. Often we think it starts with go, right? It doesn't start there. It starts with a declaration, the glorious authority of the one who gives the command, saying, I have all authority in heaven. That is a right to control or command. I have absolute power up in heaven. Also, I have absolute power and warrant on earth. Why is that important? Because everywhere you go in this world, Jesus has authority there. There's no place where he does not have jurisdiction. He's not just active in the United States of America or in North America. The whole world he has authority. So when we pray to him about Myanmar, we pray to him about North Korea, when we pray to him about what happens in Israel, when we pray these things, he has jurisdiction there. This helps us knowing that even in the hearts of your children, he has authority. That's why we can pray, and that's why things affect heaven. We saw Jesus saying this. This is why things affect earth, because he has authority. That's important and comforting and gives us courage and confidence. There is no higher authority than Christ himself. I don't care how much money or power someone may think they have. They do not have as much as Jesus does. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, the glory of God the Father, Philippians chapter 2, 10, 11, 12. So know that he has all authority. He says, all authority has been given to me, Jesus said, both in heaven and on earth. And then he sends us, therefore, because he has this, therefore, now go. And as you go, make disciples of who? All nations. Circle the word all. This was a mystery and an uh, absurdity to the Jews, but it was impregnated in the Old Testament that God cared for the nations of the world beyond our borders. Make disciples of all nations. Doing what? Baptizing them. Why? That's the initiation into the body. In whose name? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And what else? Well, teaching them to do what? There's another word. Obey everything I have commanded you. So 
So we have been sent out by God to continue his mission and building his church. Remember that. This is done through making disciples of all nations, which includes baptism, which is the designation that they are a part of the family of faith. Teaching what Jesus has commanded is the formation of a disciple. And obedience is the transformation of a disciple seen in the lives of of individuals. Christianity is just not a get smarter club. This is live this out reality. Transformation, not just information. The gospel just penetrates our mind, but doesn't penetrate our heart. We've lost. But if it penetrates our heart, it renews our minds. We're transformed. We walk in obedience to him because we love him. Not a dutiful obedience like I have to. But God, thank you for allowing me to work with what you're doing. And he says this, and surely I am with you. Only in church on Sundays when you feel good. I am with you always. I like that because he's still going to be here when you're not. To your children and your grandchildren and to the church for all generations. Surely I am with you always. Even to the ends of the earth. This is his promise. This is his will. This is his commission. So don't settle for just being comfortable. Often the American dream and the commission of Jesus collide. We'll preach the gospel. What if our missionaries, what if the apostles are more concerned about their comfort than the Great Commission? You and I will never hear the gospel. So it is a strong command. It is a commission to come and die so that you may live. Live. To live for Christ. Now, most of us, if not all of us in this room, will not physically die for the gospel. But we can die to ourselves by giving Die to ourselves by taking time by praying. We can die to ourselves by explaining to our neighbors, inviting those grumpy old people over for dinner. We can die to ourselves and exalt Him and pray for our neighbors, participate with our missionaries and ministry. It's one of my hopes for this congregation that we would be generous to our missionaries and our ministries, with our money, with our time, with our prayer. And no one can tell me that on the other side of eternity, we're going to wish or say that we gave too much. No one's going to say that. So please view your life through the lens of eternity and evaluate what you do and how you live versus what you will be glad you did on the other side because you're going to be in eternity a lot longer than you're on this earth. I've done the math. That's how it works out. So think that way. The kids are gathered, okay? Come on in if they're ready. This is, one of, this is one of the ways, this is one of the ways that we pierce the gar- darkness. 
And this is how we're going to end, and we're going to pray over these things. This is one of the ways. Okay, thanks, kids. Bring them on up. Stick them on the steps. Glad you're here. Yep, just put them up on the steps. Yep, yep. And then I want you guys to stay up here when you're done, or if you have to get more, but I want all the kids to stay up here. What's that? Okay, those of you who need to get more boxes, get it. Yep, when you're, when you're done, just stay up here, stay up front. Stay right here, up here in front, if you would. Make some room, make some room. Yeah, come on, come on up here front, guys. Just told that we have, yeah. Okay, great. So thank you, congregation. You have given uh, 89 boxes plus seven online. Well done. Thanks, kids. Glad you're here. Thank you so much. So I want you to, to visualize this, and this is just one way. You know what the most important things in these boxes are? It's not the dolls, which dolls are fun. It's not the teddy bears and the toothbrushes. It's not the combs and the games. It's the gospel that's in these boxes. This is one way that the sword of the Lord reaches the nations. And these things can go by providing practical needs, going to the hearts of people. And so these kids have helped us. And kids like these kids, and everyone go ahead and face everybody so they can look at you. Look out there, Rebecca. Kids just like these are going to receive these boxes. And we don't know their circumstances, and we don't know where all of these boxes are going to go. But our prayers go with these boxes. The gospel goes with these boxes. Our love goes in the boxes. So we're going to pray for these. And so Addie's going to pray. I'm excited about it. And so we're going to pray. And kids, and I want you to turn and face the boxes, and then just touch them or put your hand out, and we're going to pray over these boxes. Yep, thank you for that. Go ahead. We're going to pray over these boxes. For you as a congregation, I want you to add your prayers to this and then amen to this. We're going to ask God to use these to make a difference in the lives of people. Okay, you ready? Okay, let's pray together. Dear God, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for loving all the children that will get these boxes. We ask that they invite you into their heart and find out how much you love them. We ask that these gifts remind them of the gift you gave us of forgiveness. Also that they may have so much fun with the toys. Please be with their families too. May they all know the joy of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. All right. Thanks so much. Thanks, kids. Okay, kids, you can either go back to your parents or you can go back to the back to the children's workers. So either one. You can just go. And by the way, parents, there is choir practice after this today. And so remember that, too. So either go back to your parents or go in the back. And we're going to have a closing song, right, as that's happening. Let's do this. Okay. So this, this was a fun moment, wasn't it?